Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Those of you who could uh, get out of the school zone, none of us are quite clear what's going on there. But uh, um, thank you very much for joining us. This is a um, bright blue uh, event in partnership with KPMG. And bright blue, as many of you will know, is an independent think tank and pressure group for liberal conservatism. I'm Diane Banks. I'm a non-executive director of Bright Blue, and I'll be chairing the session today. Now, two of our panellists uh, apparently have got stuck in the situation in the secure zone. So if, if, if they arrive, then we'll obviously we'll bring them in when, they, when they're able to join. Please do tweet about the session. Our handle is at We Are Bright Blue, and KPMG's is at KPMG UK. And you can also use the hashtag Bright Blue. Okay, and uh, for those of you listening online, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, so please feel free to send questions through on Slido and we'll, we'll try, to, try to get to them. Okay, so today we're going to be discussing back to business, how companies can support with the cost of living. Some of the topics we'll be covering are how businesses can support their customers and employees with the, with the rising cost of living, and are there examples of innovative practice from businesses in supporting customers and employees with inflation? What's the best way to, for businesses to respond to demands for higher wages? What will the consequences of the rising cost of energy be for business? Something we've heard a lot about. Do small, medium and large businesses have different capacity to respond to the cost of living crisis? And we're going to be talking about what public policies could help businesses better support their customers and employees with rising prices. And so joining me today, um, on my right, we have Francis O'Grady, who is General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress. On my left, we have David Willits, Lord Willits, who was previously Shadow Secretary of Trade and the <coughs> Shadow Secretary of State for Trade and Industry and Minister of State for Universities and Science. And he's currently the President of the Advisory Council and Intergenerational Centre at the Resolution Foundation. And on my far left is uh, Yael Selfin, and she is the Chief Economist at KPMG in the UK. Okay, so supposed to be joining us are uh, Rocio <laughs> Concha, so um, Director of Policy and Advocacy and, and, and Chief Economist at WITCH, and James Cartledge, MP. Uh, he was previously an um, Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Justice. He's a Conservative MP for South Suffolk, so hopefully they'll be, they'll be able to join us at some point um, during the session. Right, so the format today is each speaker is going to speak for five minutes, and I am going to speak, keep it to five minutes because um, I think uh, we've, we've started late, so the next session is probably going to, going to get pushed as well. And then hopefully we'll, well we will, we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. Okay, so Francis, I'm going to ask you to go first. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks very much, and thanks very much for the invitation to join the Conservative Party Fringe. I've got to admit, I feel a bit like my hero, football hero, Tony Adams on Strictly Come Dancing, where, <laughs> you know, I know I am a fish out of water, but I live in eternal hope, so thanks for that. Um, so on the question, how can companies help with the cost of living crisis, um, it's not going to come as a huge surprise that the TUC believes they should give workers a pay rise, and a real pay rise. Um, had uh, OECD, had wages in the UK kept up with the OECD average, then your average worker would be £4,000 a year better off and would be facing some of the challenges that we're facing now, I have to say, feeling much more confident and comfortable than currently many working families are feeling. Uh, you know, as we all know, and so I'm not going to elaborate too much on this, but everybody knows that many working people in decent jobs are now feeling uh, under huge pressure, even with the help that the government announced on energy bills. Uh, again, the average en energy bill is going to be double what it was last year. Uh, we've seen what's happened with mortgages. Um, and I think it is worth, again, the TUC did this analysis. There are now one million children whose parents are in key worker jobs, jobs that were designated during COVID as being key 
to keeping this country running. One million children living in poverty. Uh, that's only the tip of the iceberg. As we know, the uh, national picture is much, much worse. Obviously, one of the points that's going to be addressed is how far is this affordable? Um, I would say that unions, um, we don't just put in pay claims, we look very, very carefully at issues of affordability. And of course, uh, many unions will be looking at the books, uh, how much profits companies have made, what the shareholder payout was, what's happening at the top of the company. Uh, and we've had a few examples of that where uh, performance at the top has been deemed to be worthy of a 30% pay increase, but apparently that's been done all by uh, themselves, the chief execs, all by himself or herself, rather than it reflecting uh, what the workforce as a whole has contributed. Um, and I guess we're also very focused on productivity. And by the way, I'm one of the people who says the problem with Britain today is not that we have too many robots, but that we don't have enough. And investment in uh, kit, equipment, people, skills, apprenticeships are human infrastructure that keeps this country running. Every employer I speak to knows that we need a healthy workforce, we need an educated and trained workforce, and we need workforces that can uh, move around the country and access broadband. So, you know, we all know that these, these uh, services, public services, are critical to wealth production too. Um, secondly, just very quick points, what government does matters too. Uh, we've argued that government should bring forward an increase in the national minimum wage because people are struggling now. Uh, obviously, no doubt, we'll have discussions about benefits and, and so on, the majority of which, of course, go to people who are in work. Um, the threat of austerity is keeping us awake at night. Um, yes, we do need fair taxes uh, to fund our public services. Um, and another key point, um, we understand that journalists are being briefed as we speak that we will get announcements on workers' rights. Uh, in particular, we have long suspected that workers' rights as agency workers and our rights on working time to paid holidays, rest breaks, and a maximum 48-hour week over a reference period, uh, that these will be weakened, if not torn up. And I would say very clearly that apart from the fact that we think it is morally wrong <laughs> to make working people weaker at a time when they need more strength at the bargaining table uh, in the midst of a cost of living crisis. It is bad for decent employers too. Many of these rights were introduced to provide a level playing field so that all working people uh, had a right to basic dignity at work and respect at work. If you pull away that rug, then you will damage the decent employer who will end up being undercut by the P&O style bad employer. Um, finally, trade unions. We can and do work with government. And if anybody wanted proof of that, many of you will be aware that the TUC and unions uh, were very, very uh, much involved in the design of the furlough scheme that ultimately saved 12 million livelihoods in this country and stopped us going over the brink. So we know how to work with government when we need to and when the country needs us to. Um, so uh, we want growth. It's a bit like motherhood and apple pie, I'm afraid. We all want growth, but we want fair and green growth so that working people not only get decent wages and conditions, but get a fair share of the pie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. I'm sure we'll get into whether m more into whether um, businesses can afford pay rises and uh, what paying what, pay, what what paying employees means in terms of uh, the, obviously they'll be able to then pay higher prices. Um, anyway, uh, so let's let's move on to you next, David. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to be here today. And, and let me say it's also great to be on the panel with Francis. And you must feel 
Welcome at these events. We very important that the Conservative Party and the TUC are always able to communicate and share ideas. And it's great that you've come here today, Francis. Um, for me, I always like coming back to Birmingham. I was brought up in Birmingham, and I was realising, reflecting, uh, and my family, we were all Birmingham um, craftsmen and uh, artisans, and I was trying, and I was reflecting on the experience of my mother. One of the reasons why uh, I'm here. My mother uh, began working for Cadbury's at Bourneville, and of course, Cadbury's famously a very enlightened employer. So she was working at Cadbury's on the production line for the chocolate, um, but she didn't really want to make her. Uh, career or do her job at Cadbury's all the time. She had other ambitions and she wanted to be a teacher. And Cadbury's, as a very enlightened employer, let her out on a day release program to start doing her teacher training, even though it had no relevance and it just meant that she wasn't always working at Cadbury's. She was off doing her teacher training and she ended up having a very long and happy career as a Birmingham primary school teacher. And that was only possible because of an enlightened employer. And uh, so it can be done and it is indeed part of the traditions of some of the best uh, businesses here in Birmingham and more widely. So what, um, what, could, we, what could we do now? I think... There's a kind of there's a two stage debate here. The first stage is that in the long run we do want to see the British growth rate improve. The chance is absolutely right about that. We need to increase our GDP per head. We've got to raise productivity, um, and here uh, there can be very constructive discussions between employers, management, and trade unions about precisely those issues. I found in my time when I was Minister for Universities and Science, I used to have meetings from time to time with some of the technician and technical support and science um, unions representing people working in national labs around the country. And first of all, they were a really good source of intelligence about what was actually happening. And secondly, they often had very good ideas about how we could actually improve their performance. So collaboration with trade unions and uh, the workforce in general, as to how companies can boost their performance, are very valuable. But, and this is where it now get, it gets a bit more charged, the question is whether you can do more, even given where the economy is today. And that's where I think the balance of argument has shifted so dramatically from when I started my career and worked for Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s and our our perception, and I still think there was a lot of truth in it, was that then the trade unions were too powerful and management was too weak and the ability to, and, and uh, labour costs were often running way ahead of the value of the performance of the workforce. We know all the issues, but that was Britain in the 1980s. It's not Britain today. I think now the issue about returns to capital, power of labour, all that has massively rebalanced. So the Problems that Britain faces today may not be the same as the problems that Britain faced then. And when at Resolution Foundation we dig into this, what you find is that even though in general wages have pretty much kept up with GDP per head, they haven't done that completely. And there are, uh, so it looks as if wages have fallen a bit behind GDP per head. And there are several reasons. One, re one in reason, incidentally, is that one form of return to labour is pension contributions. And companies uh, and em employees pay are helping to generate resources to plug deficits in company pension schemes, which counts as a return to labour in the economic statistics, but might well be, especially for me looking at it from the perspective of generational fairness, younger workers working to plug gaps in pension schemes they're not even allowed to be members of. So part of the return to labour is in the form of plugging pension deficits. So uh, actual wages are rather underperforming relative to GDP per head. And then you find something else as well, that the uh, that re returns to labour are not as evenly distributed as they were. 
And what has happened to the average may be rather different from what has happened to the median, the middle employed worker. And it looks as if more of the gains to labor, returns to labor, are being captured, particularly by people who are very highly paid. So you could see overall it looks as if pay may have kept up with GDP per head, but there could be a long tail of uh, employees who are not experiencing that and a relatively smaller group at the top who are getting particularly high returns and pulling up the average. And uh, is that simply a reflection of the improved performance of senior managers? No, I think it's partly to do with things like the bonus culture and the way in which returns to executives at the top have been driven by very powerful um, incentive schemes and bonus schemes, which means they can be rewarded for performance that may be not actually very special and could even on occasions on the long run be damaging for the company. So how a company spreads its returns, the gap between the pay of the person in the middle and the people at the top of a company, all those are legitimate matters which companies need to look at, and the gap has got much wider than it was. Then finally, on the sort of immediate issues that we face, I mean, companies have often got um, not so much simply cash today, but financial resource and access to funding and finance, which are greater than individuals who may be struggling. We had at uh, Resolution Foundation an event on this yesterday with employers talking about schemes like temporary loans to help their own staff uh, with uh, energy costs that they can repay over the following 24 months, things like that. Um, there can be flexibility on bringing forward bonuses if they're due to help with the high costs of energy over the winter, even if the bonus isn't due until the spring. Any of, that, any of those kind of modest flexibilities that help people get their way through are very welcome. And of course also setting the minimum wage and the national living wage in a way that properly helps people with their costs. So when I look at the challenges facing the British economy and how we boost our performance, uh, and they're very serious, and at Resolution Foundation we're doing an economic inquiry about this, I don't think overpaid, overpowerful workers in the labour market is a, anything is is on the top 10 list of problems that we face. It may have been in the 1980s, it isn't now. I think it's, it's interesting to think of changing times. We used reference cabarets and that of course that kind of enlightened employer was in the grand Victorian tradition of philanthropy and yeah. I don't think any of those employers had any any government help they were just enlightened they just did it off their own bat i guess because they thought that was the way to retain retain yep. their employees what, why do you think companies are not are not inspired to do this kind of thing off their own bat like the victorians were why why why, why do they why do they need government help well i think there's been an it's the sort of sh the shareholder value culture yes and the pressure of a, and a, which makes it harder to take a, a wider responsibility. I was talking to the chairman of one of our main banks on a, on a, slight, on a slightly different but related question, which was keeping open bank branches. He said, look, um, we could keep open more bank branches, but the ones we close are the ones which are relatively high cost relative to revenues. We get all these sort of um, socially responsible consultancies putting us under pressure. He said, when I actually in a closed meeting with our key fund commercial investors, say to them, OK, what should I do? Do I keep the marginal branches open and take a slight hit on returns, or do I close them and boost revenues? He said, unambiguously, the advice is you've got to close them. You have an overall legal responsibility to your shareholders. Where your shareholders, yeah. close them. Yeah. That, was the, that environment, I think, is much more direct and explicit than it used to be. Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, good, good afternoon. I'm very nice to be here. Um, we've got so many different topics to talk about today, so I'm just going to focus on a few, and then obviously we can, we can develop the others. But I thought maybe bring another point of view um, to the table. So I'm going to talk first a little bit about the wage situation in terms of where data is and what, what companies could potentially do. I mean, we have seen 
wages um, increase more or less at the historic level or maybe even a little bit higher than that. Obviously, a lot depends on the sector um, and on the individual um, companies, with especially public sector workers uh, receiving much lower wage increases recently, uh, well below inflation. But overall, on average, um, workers have found that their um, real wage has, has fallen, real wage growth has been negative, and therefore when it comes to purchasing power, they have less money to spend um, in real terms on, on average. So that is definitely an issue, but it's not that easy to solve because at the same time, we've also had companies being squeezed um, by problems with supply chains that you're all very well aware of and rising costs that they have to bear, as well as the interest rate increases that we've seen at the moment that are impacting corporate um, borrowers be ahead of households normally because they are much more, um, much more exposed to floating interest rates. So overall, it's not that straightforward for many companies to actually um, increase wages um, in line with inflation. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we need to bear in mind is that if we are going to have um, relatively strong increase in wages, that would alarm the Bank of England inevitably, and that would potentially cause higher interest rates. So there are no easy solutions, but one magic solution, if you like, um, which is a holy grail for, for all of us, is to try and get the wage increases linked to improvements in productivity. So not just provide higher wages, but actually link it to upskilling staff, providing them opportunities to, um, bring, to, to generate more output or higher value output at the same time that not only increases the wages, but also increases their um, productivity, their, their, and potentially also the, providing them with more interest, more opportunities and more interesting work. So that would be the holy grail, really, to try and do that and try and encourage companies to think more creatively as to how they can also, in this way, retain staff and attract staff, because we have a very tight labor market, um, to really move back a little bit for what you were saying, although your mother did move on, to have something that is more meaningful, longer term employment, so it's, that workers grow with, with the business, grow with the company, and they see their wages uh, rise as a result. So that, that would be my first um, point. The second one was about um, how how businesses can can or, or how public policies can help businesses um, to uh, support customers and employees and there again I just want us to just bear in mind that it is not all just households that are being squeezed it's not all businesses but there are also quite a few businesses that are being squeezed if you look at the number of insolvencies we had a huge jump in the number of insolvencies. If you look at especially smaller businesses, um, they are suffering um, more, and they're always more vulnerable, but we have seen the number of defaults uh, rise, especially uh, for smaller businesses. So we need to be mindful that it's not always that easy for businesses as well to navigate such turbulent um, times. And one of the things that, um, there's a number of things where public policy can help businesses, help customers and, and employees. One of them that is very important is um, stability. <laughs> um, because it is very costly for businesses to try and make business decisions that are not going to work. So if they are going to make plans, they're going to make investments, they need to decide how much stock to buy, etc., etc. Having the um, uncertainty and potentially uh, big changes in the environment would make it much more likely for them to make mistakes, costly mistakes in terms of um, ordering stock, in terms of hedging 
um, or understanding the, what prices to buy and to sell. So stability is really important. Stability in policy is very important. And there's, there's a lot about infrastructure. We've talked about infrastructure already, but trying to um, accelerate infrastructure in broadband is very important, but there's also infrastructure to, um, to try and encourage new technologies um, and, and green energy um, that is very important as well and can accelerate quite a lot in, of investment because my third point really in all of this is productivity. We need to increase productivity in the UK in order to lift growth, in order to lift the uh, wealth of the people who live here and in order to increase productivity, in, uh, inevitably we will need to try and encourage stronger private investment as well as more public investment. And in order to encourage stronger private investment, um, certainty or clarity about the future is very important, probably more important actually than um, tax cuts, is, is having more stable um, business environment where companies can plan uh, long horizons, um, that is very important, as well as support in infrastructure and um, education. So help with upskilling staff um, and, and getting our workforce with the right skills for business. Thank you. Um, it, that's interesting what you said about linking wage increases to increases in productivity and long-term, hence long-term retention of staff. Could you point to any specific examples of things that KPMG are doing in that respect? Your well, at KPMG, we have a lifelong plan in terms of when you join the firm, you, the, the idea is that you will stay with us until you retire, potentially, and you move up gradually um, during your, your time at KPMG. Because that's, that's quite unusual mm -hmm. these days. Yes. I mean, there's... For, uh, yeah. In my day job, I work in the media, and you know people hop around every two, three years. Mm. There, there are just—I yeah. I, guess—that they're, they're, it's made up of much smaller companies, but that is quite unusual. I mean, it's fantastic, yeah. mm. um, and I think I think you make a very good point because I mean, one thing that occurs to me is that we've moved away from from that um, from that approach. Um, okay. Um, Francis, I, I, I just I just like to ask you a question. You made a really interesting point. Um, you talked about the trade unions working with the government on the furlough scheme and it does occur to me that over the last 40 years or so the trade unions have assumed quite a different role they've become the 21st century trade union is quite a different beast to the, 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 the what it was in the kind of mid 20th century i mean do, do do you want to can you say a bit about how you think the the, the 21st century trade union looks as as our times evolve? I'm not sure it has changed. Okay. Much. I okay. Mean, if you look at the 20th century, there are always kind of big initiatives, not least during wartime, when <coughs> unions were seen as absolutely at the heart of decision making. I think um, I think we are we look and feel like a different movement in that we're actually majority women which again people don't always uh, seem to realize and perhaps some of that kind of macho talk that we sometimes hear why, why, uh, from why? other quarters why do you think doesn't go down so well with our members right um uh, we also we are growing as a movement which again you wouldn't always know from reading the press uh, we saw more people coming to join us, particularly through COVID, when they were, obvi for obvious reasons, really worried about security in their futures. Um, so I, th I think the union movement has always had that role of defending people's paying conditions on the shop floor, looking for more satisfying and skilled work, but also in terms of public policy, we've always had ideas. And the question is, you know, whether we get a fair hearing for mm -hmm. those ideas. I think we did get a fair hearing for furlough. I'm not sure some of our more our ideas about growth, for example, are necessarily getting the hearing that we'd like. Right. Because, you know, I was kind of fascinated to hear about, I mean, we have got the lowest growth in the G7, the lowest investment and the worst pay increases. And I think it is worth reflecting on why is that? What, what has Britain been doing for the last 10, 20 years 
compared to other countries? Why are other countries doing better than us? Yes. And, and clearly, we would argue that if you do want a fairer economy, then trade unions, are, as democratic organisations of ordinary working men and women, are an essential part of that. And there is international evidence to show that where, you, where more of the workforce is covered by collective bargaining, where workers have strong rights, you can take that high road to greater productivity. I would yes. argue that one key problem in Britain today is that labour is too cheap. Uh, you know, we have five million people earning less than the real living wage. We have millions on insecure contracts. Uh, we're about to see a new assault on workers' rights and on their trade unions' ability to organise and protect and defend people's real pay and living standards. That, to me, is going to see growing inequality and an even bigger imbalance of power at the bargaining table, which is not good for any of us. Thank you. OK, um, now I'll open it up to questions. Um, anyone like to start? Uh, yeah, one here. Hi there. Uh, Sam from Bright Blue. So uh, obviously I think a lot of the debate uh, around um, around raising wages, as, uh, as Yale mentioned, is, is around improving productivity. Uh, and you could say it's, it's the, the central mission of, of the trust government um, supply side reforms to raise growth. So I don't, I don't know if the panel had any thoughts on if there are quick wins on productivity, um, or at least if, if there aren't quick wins, if there are any um, kind of o obvious reforms uh, that, that um, we should go for uh, and how to help companies, um, companies do them. Good question. David? Well, when you look at, well, we're, we're doing a kind of economic inquiry resolution at the moment, and we are, we've done the analysis, which rather ties in with what Francis was saying. It does show we are, we have been underperforming really since the financial crash in the British economy compared with other advanced Western countries. Um, there are so many different ways of raising productivity. I would put quite high, it looks like a Delegation are coming. <laughs> well, oh, right. They have to be let out. Coming, coming to ask for a pay increase. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think we've been a, you've been locked in, and what? we've been yes. locked out. What on earth? No, we don't know what. Don't happened. know. Just some security right. alert. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, we're just taking a few questions. Um, Let's, um, we'll, we'll, finish, we'll finish this question, and then we'll let you guys do your, your five-minute thing. But the question I was just sort of just answering was, you know, what are, which is the key question, which you will have views on, is simply what <coughs> more we can do. What can we actually do to boost productivity? And when you, when you look at use of land, you find that England, in particular, even when compared with other densely populated areas such as Belgium or the Netherlands has very has much less built on land than they do. We are busy preserving particularly large parts of the southeast when in most other countries parts of those would be built on. I used to I, I researched this more deeply a while back. You know, the number of pig farms within 25 miles of the centre of London. We are we are protecting agricultural activities surprisingly close to one of the world's major cities. And of course, it's got to be done carefully. It's got to be done. You can't just concrete things over. You want to pre preserve green spaces. But land use in Britain is pretty shocking and inefficient. That would be quite hard on my list. Secondly, skills and vocational training. And actually, partly because in our party we've become preoccupied with apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are one way of delivering vocational training but there are many others and indeed as you've got to get an employer already before you can have an apprenticeship and employers increasingly tend to focus on actually offering apprenticeships to employees they already know so apprenticeships our uh, majority of apprenticeship starts now amongst over 25 year olds. We need some more innovation in skills and vocational training for younger people and help them get the first job. Um, and, thir and third, and then I'll stop. Although the government's got a great list of sort of eight priority areas that Quasi is going to develop in the next few weeks, it is striking that innovation, science, technology is not on that list of eight, which I very much regret. I still think we should be able, we should be able to harness the quality of our research base better and provide government support for 
a long journey from the lab to the marketplace. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to get Yale and Francis answer that question, and then um, I'll let James and uh, Rocio uh, pitch in. Uh, Yale, did you have? So any? I think, I mean, productivity is is first that we we're never going to be exactly sure why it's so weak in the UK. Um, there'll be many reasons for it. I think we've just had a lot of very good potential solutions. I would add. Um, flexibility so it is about housing but it also uh, probably something like the stamp duty and all mm -hmm. the different taxes around it that don't encourage people to move more across the UK is not a good thing because what is missing here is the management skills and one of the things that would be great is if we get more people from the top companies that normally are in, in Lond around London to move to other parts of the country and help with that upskilling and improvement of management because management is potentially one of the things where we're weak as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, levelling up. Um, Francis? It's certainly true, we've got one of the best educated top managements in this country and the worst trained online managers. Um, and, you know, again, as a trade unionist, I believe people have the right to be managed well, and that's why it's well worth investing in the skills of management. But a really quick win, I think the 50% cut to further education training is a complete false economy. And it's, again, people from working class backgrounds who have been hit hardest by that. So if you really wanted to turn it around quickly and, uh, you know, put some meaning behind the aspiration we all share to skill up Britain, then I think investing in further education is really important. Secondly, never underestimate the ingenuity of the workforce. If the workforce has a voice and a way to put its ideas to management, I've seen it time and time again in different industries. There are often brilliant ideas that come from the shop floor if people are given the autonomy and the respect for those ideas to be listened to and very often taken on board. And again, that's where unions play a critical role. Great, thank you. Okay, um, James and Rocio, um, so uh, you, you were both asked to prepare five minutes on how, co <laughs> how, companies, can, <laughs> how companies can help with the cost of living crisis. So we don't want to leave you out. So James, do you want to just say a few words? Well, just as brief, so I think two particular experiences for me to draw on really uh, are that I ran an SME before becoming an MP. It's a company that's still going. Um, we survived the credit crunch. Um, and actually, very recently, a very special thing to me, uh, I have reduced my equity um, because we've given out shares to our longest serving employees. And I think that, um, you know, I'm very proud of that. And I think that the question is, how do you, how do you help with the cost of living for companies? In the current economy, you have got to back your staff and you have got to you know, it's not just about recruitment, it's about retention. This is a very tight labour yes. market. It's yes. really difficult. If you've got talent, you've got to hold on to it, you've got to nurture it, you've got to reward it, you've got to incentivise it. And I think that is so important. I mean, I've only ever run a small, relative small business, but it's had a core of talent, which I have tried to nurse so they feel part of the business. You're right, actually, you know. Uh, Francis, you know, at this point, letting them have a say in it, be creative, etc. cetera. Um, admittingly, you know, we have a huge variety in the size of the businesses in this country. I think our biggest businesses are actually pr productivity, less, productivity is less of an issue. It's for yes. the smaller businesses. And I think there's some com complex reasons for that. But the other thing is, I mean, I actually, in our company, I, I'm not involved day to day anymore because I'm an MP. Um, we gave out a bonus to help with the cost of living. Now, obviously not every company can afford that, for example. But, you know, things like that have real merit to the staff. You know, they really, you, you, you've backed them and you get that back, you really do. Um, the, the other thing I was just going to say, uh, I was a Justice Minister, before that I was uh, Rishi Sunak's PPS when he was the Chancellor, through, through the pandemic, and, you know, I, the, the, it's just an observation which has been borne out recently, I think. The thing that matters most to business is the macroeconomic climate above all. You have to have confidence and stability in the economy. Um, and I think today's move was welcome because really the thing that was affected by the recent, you know, uh, mini budget, whatever you want to call it, was this thing about confidence and stability. Um, you know, I, 
the company I set up, we were mortgage brokers to start with. We then became a property portal, and it's now Crochet to buy. It's the, it's the main property portal for shared ownership properties. If you bought one, it probably was on my website. Um, and we, I remember doing mortgages in 2008 when the day ca came when literally there were none left. Suddenly it was like, there aren't any. Literally, there are none. You know, and businesses went bust overnight. Houses, there, were, there was no new build housing going ahead for, you know, weeks. This caused enormous problems. And so when it came to the pandemic, I, I said to Richie, I said, look, there are going to be businesses tomorrow that literally the custom will stop and you've got to act really quickly. It doesn't matter. Get the money out the door as fast as you can. That's why, for example, on bounce back loans, maybe they weren't as strict as they could have been, but the money had to get out the door. Yes. And, and so, 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 but yeah, so if you ask me personally, what should we do to help with the cost of living? You've got to value your staff. That was true anyway, because of this is a tight labor market. Um, you want to get the best out of them. But, you know, I would, I would really emphasize that. Um, different challenges for different types of companies. I've never run a big manufacturing business. It's very different. I would just finish on that, that certainly what I see in my constituency and nationally, that's not where the productivity issues are. I think it's in the service sector. And it may even be almost statistical, right? If you run, you know, if you run a cafe or something, how do you measure productivity? How do you improve it? One thing I would say is if you enlarge your premises, like there was a cafe in my village, they, their business rates went up. You know, what a ridiculous tax system where you get hit and punished if you invest in your business. You know, so we've got to incentivize investment. But I think, I, th I, I still personally think we don't understand well enough the, the SME sector in this country and what really drives the lower productivity that supposedly exists. Yeah, yeah we, we were talking about staff retention earlier. Um, uh, I, I'd asked, yeah, what uh, they, they did at KPMG to retain staff, and then we were talking about how certainly industries that are dominated by smaller businesses find it difficult to hold on to staff. I mean, you, you, younger staff particularly will jump around every two years. And it is incredibly just, I mean, I'm, I'm going through that in my own business at the moment. Um, Offboarding and onboarding employees, it is incredibly disruptive for business and it kind of sets you and it's two steps forward so, and one step back again. So, we have a, a, a challenging mental health trust in Suffolk. Norfolk Suffolk Foundation Trust is inad has been inadequate for many years. I thought they struggled to recruit. It turns out, I met them what they struggle with is to retain. And this is across the public sector, the private sector. It's partly generational. People have choice. Yeah. And they move around, and you it's, know. It's difficult in small businesses because there's nowhere to go. I mean, the two members of staff. Uh, that I've just lost that there's just nowhere to go it's a tiny business so you know if they want to progress they, they've got to move on so uh, for SMEs that's yeah. that is that that's a problem okay uh, Rocio come coming to you now so director of policy and advocacy at which yeah so um, you all have been discussing about what businesses can do for employees which is uh, very important we are facing at which also the same challenges uh, how we can support our employees. But if I may, I would like to talk about what business can do for consumers, uh, which obviously is the other side of um, people are employees and consumers. So as a, as a self-funded charity, we can see that businesses are also under incredibly amount of pressure because obviously you have the increases in your costs, the supply costs, but also you have a demand that actually has to make savings. So it's a very difficult situation. However, we think that businesses can do more to help consumers. Uh, in particular, those businesses are in essential uh, services, like for example, supermarkets, telecoms, energy, even with the support that the government has announced. Uh, what else businesses can do to help consumers to manage the current very difficult situation? So we, um, we launched a campaign last, uh, last week on that, asking, for example, with supermarkets to be uh, thinking about the value range, the offer on the value range, and see the areas where are needed the most, how they can increase the supply of that. We have worked with Leeds University also in a tool that will help supermarkets and local authorities and others to find areas that actually need additional help in terms of uh, access to food and good value uh, in that respect. On telecoms, we won, uh, as you probably all know, uh, many of them have, are offering social tariffs. 
but the take up of these social data and good quality in general, uh, with uh, few exceptions. And the take up of that is only 3.2% of those people that qualify for that. So how we can um, help people with the um, understanding of that social ties so people can have, can go for that rather than, you know, reducing, you know, not having connectivity. But actually, you are not connected in this world. You are not basically able to engage with society. But also about clarity on pricing, clarity in, um, you know, unit pricing in the supermarket. You try to budget, to buy, you know, a budget, and you try to compare prices. Sometimes it's very difficult because the way that things are priced, the unit price. And, and also customer services. So con consumers are under a lot of pressure at the moment. They need companies that actually answer the phone and you know, give them advice. You think about uh, energy companies when you get this direct debit, you're direct opening your uh, bills, but also you get, you, you get the government support, but then you get changes in your di direct debit that increase it and you don't know why. You want to be able to talk to the energy companies for explaining this. Uh, but you also now have the mortgage. People will be under a lot of pressure because of the increase in the in the interest rate. So making sure that people have, you know, that company have uh, customer service there to answer questions for consumers. So a, a little bit of a different angle that you have been mm -hmm. in relation to, you know, focusing on employees, yeah. but it's also thinking also about consumers, how companies can do. Yeah, so going back to those social tariffs, I mean, that's an extraordinary low take-up. Is it, is it because the, 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 the providers aren't incentivised to advertise them? Well, they, certainly not? the providers, some of the providers are trying to uh, raise awareness, but certainly more need to be done. I think that there are also misconceptions for people that qualify for those social tariffs about the quality of that connection, the speed of that connection. So obviously, we need to make sure that people understand that actually some of these social tariffs have very good good quality mm. in a way. So we uh, understanding that barriers. I think that there is also about the, is the um, issue of using data. DWP have data that can make the qualifying process much easier. And now they just launch a service that are basically offering to telecommunications providers and say you can, with, cons with the right consent from uh, consumers, you can get access to that data and therefore you call uh, a telecommunication provider, they can see very immediately whether you qualify and make the process much easier yeah. um, on that. So it definitely doesn't make sense that take up is 3.2%. Yeah, no, 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 and, and by the way, have increased recently. I think that because people are trying to increase awareness on this, but also, also, you know, there is a lot to go still. Oh, that's a fascinating insight. Okay, uh, we have uh, 20 minutes for questions. So any questions? One here. I, I wanted to build on, on oh, sorry. I, yeah, I wanted to build on uh, Rocio's point about what um, companies can do to, to help consumers. So to, to build on, 19 billion pounds worth of support goes unclaimed each year from the social security system. And one of the initiatives we've seen during the pandemic and, um, and, and now through the cost of living crisis is companies that we were trying to get to do take up work now actively want to do it. It's gone from being like, a, a oh yeah, that's a nice to have you guys on the social side do it over there to being a board level priority. So we've started to see uh, energy companies, utility companies, maybe some of the broadband providers as well, when they are giving out social tariffs, actually assessing for support through the social security system. So people who might be eligible for but not claiming universal credit, um, when they, they get into trouble with their water bill, their energy bill, they might turn to them first. And then they're getting that wider level of support. And I guess that the, the, the point I want to make, or the question, I, I'll frame it as, as a question, but it's if everyone... If many companies are doing this, it becomes a really strong win-win-win for government, consumers, and the companies because people who would otherwise not be able to pay their bills, get into debt, get into arrears, um, start to start to get that support from lots of different places. The admin costs of doing all of that come down. Um, and there's a great case study with Anglian Water that um, uh, that that we can speak to or. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and some, some great work going on at local authority level as well to automate take up a pension credit. But it feels like, again, there's much more, we could move much faster in this direction. And I suppose there's a comment there on on um, what's the likelihood of that happening given restrictions around data and, and other things that kind of slow it down. What's the likelihood of that happening? Um, anybody want to take that? I mean, it's very tricky. Um, 
But I, you're absolutely right about the take-up issue. And of course, it's a really, really need. It would be great to have proper social tariffs across the energy now. I think it's a, mm -hmm. a priority. And I think the Treasury looked at it in terms of the emerg emergency package, but it was quite hard. The, the broadband comms agenda is significantly ahead of the energy agenda when it comes to social tariffs. That's interesting in itself to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we have green tariffs. Yes, but that's on the slightly different criteria. Isn't Understood. It? And yeah. they're also, um, I think there's a lot of questions about because, of course, they aren't green tariffs, really. Uh, I, I, I've, I've been asked this quite a bit by constituents. Uh, one of the common emails is, um, I've got a green tariff. Why is it going up, given the, cause the price of gas has gone up? Mm. And, and I, and so Ofgem have this standard answer you'll find, which mentions smoothies, which is that the energy that comes through your wall is a smoothie. I, it's always a... It comprises all the inputs. It's never just one form. But that is not clear from a from a renewables uh, tariff, is it? You assume it's coming from offshore wind, all of it, or something. You know. So I think big need for clarity there. Um, but can I, one thing on that, look, it's, it's a really important point, what more can firms do, but they really need to do that, what they are charged with doing. So a good example is the banks. There is going to be more stress on mortgage holders. There's no question about it. Um, I wish that wasn't the case. And I hope that, you know, we're already, the FCA is thinking about the sorts of advice that's, that's going to be out there. Are people going to be able to go back to interest only, for example, which is what mm. you used to be able to do if you are under stress? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if your mortgage payments go up yeah. £300 pounds on a capital repayment mortgage, you may find that on an interest only yeah. basis, and I wouldn't, you shouldn't do this normally, but it, it, that it stays the yeah. same. You know, these sorts yeah. of things we're going to have to start thinking about. Yeah. But that's what I want to see them focusing on, you know, how do we really help people when it, they have responsibility for? <laughs> I think that don't we need to come back to the root of this problem, though? Why are people now facing absolute nightmares in respect of their mortgages? Uh, it's not something that they've brought on themselves or should be paying for for years to come. It's because we had a pretty disastrous mini-budget that has had a real impact on the living standards of working people. And, I, you know, for sure, there will always need to be emergency help there will always need to be a, a decent social security and benefit system but i can tell you the working people i speak to want to earn a decent mm. wage mm. and that's how most people would prefer to live including in our public services we have huge recruitment and retention problems in the nhs we've got people leaving in droves because frankly uh they feel that they were clapped and then they were clobbered. Uh, you know, this is real stuff that we have to deal with now. And that, important though, I think some of these discussions are tweaking around the edges as to why are we, how, why have we ended up in this mess and who's expected to pay for it? Mm. Because I can tell you the people I speak to feel it shouldn't be them. Do you know, it, it, I, I don't know if you do have the stats on this or have a sense, but people that are, I, obviously, you know, I know people are leaving the NHS in drove for the reason you, you stated. Are they typically going on to alternative employment? Is there, is there a trend as to where they're going? It, when you look, it depends on the pay rates. You look at, for example, in social care, I've spoken to so many people who you can imagine are incredibly skilled and dedicated, but they felt they did their duty through the pandemic and more than yeah. and they could get equivalent wages because most of them as you know are on less than £10 an yeah, hour yeah, for yeah. doing that job yeah. which I think many of us in the room wouldn't do in a million years it's too tough and it's too demanding uh, but they can get similar wages working in a supermarket and there's that sense of I can leave the job when I, you know, I'm not saying supermarket work can be demanding mm. too but you can leave the job when you clock off yes. uh, in a way that you can't with care work or in the NHS. So the, that issue about morale and motivation, and I, by the way, I would concede it's not all about money. It's about feeling respected, yeah, it, and people don't feel yeah. respected. Can I just come back on a couple of those points? Is that possible? Uh, yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just on the interest rates, first of all, I mean, Francis, you're right in the sense that clearly the public will have someone in mind when they look, those mortgage rates go up, but most of the rise will actually be due to the yeah. path of interest rates going up because inflation is going up, yeah. and whoever was in power, inflation would be going up uh, as it is globally. 
Um, doesn't mean clearly there isn't we could have handled that better. But on I think on the social care point, I I agree about the pay and social care. I think slightly different than the NHS actually relatively speaking, the NHS especially internationally our NHS staff are relatively well paid. Um, I say relatively. I mean, my mum's a nurse. Um, but in social care, oh, fine, um, right, there yeah. is definitely an issue. It's incredibly hard work. Um, if you are, if you are in a particular sort of kind of dementia wing or something, it's just incredibly tough, hard work. And but but here's the thing, right? We have a health and social care levy which is going to be scrapped. Labour Party didn't support it. You have to have a way to pay for more money in social care that's sustainable. No one wants to talk about property issue mm -hmm. we've got a cap now coming in David I, I may be going on subject but I, you love this subject as well we've got a cap uh, the cap's still going to be there it's just the, the funding mechanism for it's going to go you know so this liability scheme to, so we've all got to talk about how we we pay for this because that's how you get the start and and you need a proper career structure Suffolk University have this apprenticeship for social care give it more esteem etc it is really hard work and I agree that we pay more but for that to happen the system has got to have a sustainable way of funding it that we can all agree on. Mm. The TUC didn't support the increase in national insurance either because we thought it would hit right. the low paid and younger workers hardest. But we did advocate equalisation of capital gains tax with income tax, which would raise we raised enough. far less. Capital enough. gains in its, in, in its entirety it would raise raises less to than to give me. every public servant a 10% pay increase. Well, it's interesting. I'd, have to, I'd love to see your figures. I'd love to see if it. Yeah, Jay, I mean, the, PPR but, I, I was in the debate when, when the Labour Party was saying, "Yeah, you use wealth taxes." The whole reason for using national insurance, and it's not my preference, not my preference. The reason for it is because it's simple and it raises significant revenue because employers and employees. Pay it. You can dispute that, but it raised 17 billion pounds so that we could fund dealing with the backlog, dealing with social care. There are many imperfections with that. But all the other alternatives, they don't raise anything like the same. People can easily avoid them. Uh, and by the way, we've had the levy now for two months. I've never had a single email yeah. from a single constituent saying, oh, yeah. I don't like this health and yeah. social care levy. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not because he doesn't like a debate, but David has to go, yeah. so I'm just going <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, I think it's all livening up. I mean, you don't have to go. <laughs> and, I, and, I have to say, and, and, I, and I thought James's initial opening points about what he thought should be done as an employer have brought into reality some of the ideas we were talking about before James arrived. Mm. And it was a fantastic example. I, I just wanted to say on this... I thought, we're, and I have enormous respect for Francis and the TUC, I thought Francis was a li little bit harsh on the point that James made about mortgages and flexibility on mortgages. Because, And I come at this, I must say, partly from a generational perspective, which is one of my preoccupations. One of the reasons why we boomers have ended up scoring <laughs> such high rates of home ownership is that mortgages were not regulated when we needed them the way they are now. It was so much easier to get a mortgage. And what happened is after we'd got our mortgages and we then became people with savings in banks and life insurance themes and everything, we suddenly shifted from wanting a nice, easy, light regulatory regime where you could have interest-only mortgages and all that. We suddenly, after the financial crash, everybody went for very heavy regulation of mortgages to protect our savings. So for the younger generation, the mortgage regulatory regime is far tougher and, David, and, by to and let, less flexible. And does not have with, regulation and it's Indeed, just and, in, absolutely. And we and made it easier for us to get a second property to rent out than it for, for because you are not and I, I have this argument with our incredibly bright young researchers at Resolution Foundation you want to compare prices and don't always compare the different regulatory regimes so the idea that you could at least temporarily during this pressure point go back to simply interest only not repayment mortgages I think is is quite a good one practice. yeah it's quite a good one and it would just enable people under pressure now to have the kind of freedoms financial we, the key well, issue well, there. Um, there were reasons. Uh, uh, but, uh, so, I did, so anyway, I wanted to, so I sadly I've got to get back into the conference centre for a, a commitment. But anyway, so I, and thank you very much for inviting me along. And, you know, we'll <laughs> leave them at it. We'll leave them at it. Haven't we told It's just, yeah, I'm sorry to be having thank to go. You. But I've got a commitment. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. So I think we can take two more questions. Yeah. So there's one here. Uh, yeah, it's um, Matt Dykes here, and I'm, oh, I'm also from the TUC, there's a bit of an interloper in the corner here. But uh, I, just a, an, on the social care point, I mean, I think one of the, we've been talking about how we raise productivity. Whenever this discussion happens in events like this, everyone talks about investment. But one of the, uh, isn't one of the problems in the UK 
is that our productivity is of, often based on a disinvestment model about sweating assets, taking money out, looking at everything as a cost, sweating the labour force, cutting pay, cutting jobs. And social care is a really good example of that because you've got an industry here which can't be offshored, it can't be completely digitised, it's got a growing and pretty inelastic demand curve <laughs> looking ahead, and yet the customer gets a shit deal because you know, you've got people getting 15 minute um, home care visits, a lot of residential settings aren't great. The workforce certainly gets a poor deal with 40% of them on zero hours contracts and below the uh, national living wage or real living wage. Um, and James, and I know you're coming from a good place, but you're talking about, oh, who's going to fund this? It's a cost, it's a burden. Why don't you have an industrial strategy based around investment and increasing productivity through investment in social care? Turning those jobs into good jobs, skilled jobs, with actual progression and skills and a whole framework of how well, you get on that's in that exactly what with I a said. pay structure around it. That's exactly that, what I said. So I was talking about the University of Suffolk, the idea of uh, having a proper career path through. I agree. The answer is not a minimum wage in social care, by the way, and the, the answer is progression. There just is no progressive structure. Exactly. If you had, I mean, when you say, I mean, obviously there is a minimum wage, um, the way to increase pay in the social care sector is you do need the investment, but the point is because it's publicly funded to such a large degree, there has to be a funding mechanism for that. And I'm afraid no one to date has come up with one that is credible. Um, the, the wealth stuff sounds good in theory. It wouldn't raise anything like enough money to pay for it. Um, but, but, you know, I do agree. There has to be, basically there has to be an esteem around that job. If you think that, you know, being a nurse in the NHS, whatever we think of it, it clearly has a career path. It has, I think, a lot of esteem prestige you might say um, we need the same for social care this is very personal to me because you know I, my parents are right in that moment I can tell you I'm getting text messages from social workers and all the rest of it and it you know anyone who's been in there it is unbelievable they always need better information it's a very confusing system um, but I don't think you'll ever get easy get around it because there will always be people who don't have any savings or assets and people who do and it's like this very difficult way of, of getting to it I just think that as a country we've got to decide do we want our elderly to have dignity in those last years, do we value it enough? Because if we do, it's going to cost more, because then you can afford to have this, this career structure. Sorry, Sorry very uh, quick come back. The investment, though, won't it pay for itself in the long run, through increasing wages and better jobs in every community in our country? In the long run, wouldn't it be create a virtuous cycle? Of course it would, yeah. But you have to have that fundamental decision on funding, which we took, and there's now going to be reversed. And Social care is once again to be, be a subject in a general election. Yeah, well, did you have any thoughts on that? So, so I think there's one thing that we need to face, which is uh, the certain things are worth much more and we need to pay more for them. And social care is one of them. It's not the only one. Um, there's, I can think of um, a lot of what we call domestic work, like cleaners, nannies, um, a lot of these things we used to get very, very cheaply, relatively cheaply, but it is not fair and it's not sustainable. And what it means is that ultimately we will need to, to take a bigger, a bigger chunk of other things that we consume, um, all of us, and spend it on those things. So it's not so much only about investment, it's more about thinking, okay, so we will have fewer holiday, fewer expensive holidays, and more money will be spending on care or, or, or saving for care or paying government to pay us through taxes for care. Because we are an aging population, we, have, we consume a lot of services, we're not paying for those services the right price at the moment. So unfortunately, <laughs> it's not the answer you all want to hear, yeah. um, that's but, the but that's the reality. One of my big concerns in social care, which leads me to a, a bigger point, is about the role of private equity. And um, we've been watching very closely because if we end up with a kind of Carillion sort of situation in social care, Carillion was bad enough, believe you me, but obviously when you're dealing with very vulnerable people who were literally, if they had to leave a home, that can be, you know, people mm. die. When, when they're that old and fragile. So uh, closures would be a major problem. But there is a bigger problem about the British economy, which is that 
the majority of shares in companies in Britain are held overseas. And they change hands now in a matter of months rather than years. So the, the kind of creation of uh, decent public services, a sense of a stake in the long-term future of the country is more challenging for us here than it is for other countries where they have public sector champions in energy, for example, that provides some kind of balance and some kind of check uh, on uh, standards, both for labour but for corporations more generally. So I think there is a, a kind of bigger question about how we achieve a good growth model and how we get from A to B, given we're starting in a place that doesn't give us as many levers to pull compared to other countries. I probably disagree with that, mm. just very, very quickly, because I think this is quite dangerous in the sense that one of the things we're missing now, the way the country is moving, is more, um, more interaction with the world. Because as you say, we're less productive, that all we need well, is more examples. The, the world. It's the fact that we're owned by many other governments. It's, Our well, companies are owned by many other governments. governments. But they Just give us best practice. Britain. They give us actually, they can help us, they can help our managers do better, they actually give us more ideas about innovation, about how to be more productive. So I wouldn't, and they give us good um, funding. What we need is good regulation, we need good um, checks and balances, yeah. but not necessarily less capital yeah, or exactly. the good advice we, we that we can get. Country, and we, we, so, we is depend. France, so is Germany, but they, they deliberately keep No, no well, we depend more than they do on what's called, and what um, our former governor of the Bank of England called the kindness of strangers. We do, we have historically had um, a, a reliance on inward investment. It's an incredibly important part of the economy. It has good things, it has bad things about it. Um, but, you know, I, I, yes, it's an extreme example, but in Russia at the moment, they are, they are waking up to the total withdrawal of inward investment, uh, international presence, all the rest of it. If that happened in the UK, something like that, w we would be far poorer yeah. for it. Uh, you're chasing with respect, I think, and I, I understand where you come from, France, but hold on. In, you're you're chasing... With ownership. No, but, but, well, ultimately, at least, at least for the same <laughs> thing, right? What is the main form of human investment? It's buying stakes, investing in British companies, buying shares here. Yes, property as well, um, but ultimately, you know, that helps us to meet our standard of living. And if we didn't have it, we would be poor and not wealthier. Well, I'd like to be, you know, again, if you look at the G7, I think you'll see a different pattern. And I think there's a delusion if we think that we're better off than some of those other countries that deliberately drive industrial I didn't say strategies. That. I said oh, we're better off than we would be if we didn't have openness to inward investment and the international economy, which is just the way our economy works, for better or worse. Okay, I want I, I'll give time for one more question, and I'm going to have to wrap up. Uh, it was what? Yes, over here. A slightly different angle to the conversation <laughs> uh, we've just had. Um, Good. We've had a lot of um, discussion around sort of the role of businesses versus the role of government in sort of encouraging businesses to take action, um, and whether that's through regulation or um, incentivisation. I don't think that's a word. Um, and it was just interesting to hear the panel's views on what you think the role of government is, is encouraging businesses to do more. Um, so picking up on some of Rossio's points around sort of the role of businesses in um, helping people with the cost of living. So I'm from Citizens Advice, sorry. So um, things like mid-contract price rises. Where, what's the role of government in encouraging companies to do more? Sure. Or should the onus be on companies themselves? Well, sure, absolutely. Role of government. Okay, if we can keep it to two sentences each. Uh, Rocio, I'm going to start with you and go down the well, table. I think, I think that it's a combination of both. And definitely there is a role for the government to encourage those companies that don't want, you know, they are not doing the right thing to do it. Um, I think that there is a role in government also in what the point that I was saying before about that using data in much better ways to make sure that the support that some businesses have is targeted uh, to consumers. So I think it's both. Businesses need to do more, and if they don't, they don't do it, then the government probably need to uh, put pressure on them to do it. Okay, I think government has a, a key role to play in setting the framework within which we all operate, whether we're businesses, unions, uh, citizens. And um, I never underestimate the convening power of government, 
Uh, I often used to say that I'd met Angela Merkel more times than I'd met our own Prime Minister, and that's because in Germany they have that tradition of bringing business unions and others together to look not just at five-year plans, but 10, 20, 30-year plans. They're accused sometimes of being rigid, but my goodness, that provides some certainty. Um, Labour standards are important. As I say, this was always traditionally, from Winston Churchill and the Wages Councils onwards, it was about stopping the decent employer being undercut by the bad. The great advantage of a level playing field that forces everyone um, to up their game. And finally, industrial strategy. We've had lots of strategies printed, some of which actually have a lot in there that could build a very broad consensus, or could have built a very broad consensus. Um, but what happened to them? Where was the action? Where was the driving them forward on a long-term basis? And you can only do that if you win a broad and deep consensus, including with unions, to make it happen. Okay. And that's why I'm a big fan of government's convening power. OK, OK, James. Well, I think, and certainly my experience going back to the crunch, credit crunch, etc., and recent days have shown the most important role for companies, uh, sorry, for government in relation to the economy is the top level macro framework and, you know, stability, confidence. This is the most important ingredient a government can provide. And, you know, this is not new. I, I was writing back in May with cost of living, what the government should do, targeted help, but beyond that, really resist, you know, increasing borrowing, unfunded tax cuts or spending, firm hand on the tiller. If we'd have done that, I think we, we, we'd have still seen interest rates rising, but not as sharply, and uh, we'd have maintained a uh, maximum level of, of confidence. So I think it's the most important thing. Confidence is the elixir of a modern economy. But beyond that, um, I believe in free enterprise. I think you should let businesses be free to, you know, chart their course as far as possible. But there are certain specific interventions. The best one I can give, as I say, mortgage business, I was astonished, astonished that, you know, you could, the, the mortgage criteria back in two, what, 2007 was, do you have a pulse, basically? And there you go. Here's a mortgage for £400,000 on an interest-only basis, even though you, you know. I mean, it was crazy. So the, the government should have regulated that better. Yeah. And that's why, as David, uh, Lord Willett said, you know, the, the, the regulation is much stricter. So there are specific sectors where you do need regulation, and it needs a top-level stability. But beyond that, it, it is important that government doesn't try to run the economy from Whitehall. Okay, yeah. So I just want you to pick on lifelong, uh, lifelong learning, and I think government can help with that because we need it for, product for productivity, for also for higher uh, wages. To help with that, they need to be much, uh, much more open-minded in the support that they give and make it much easier for both employees and employer to access, to access any support. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna have to shoot into the secure zone if I can to share something else in 10 minutes time. So we're gonna have to wrap up here, but thank you very much to KPMG for making this event possible. And thank you all for um, attending and um, for your patience while we messed around trying to figure out what on earth was going on over there. Thank you very much. And um, oh, oh, and I need to say, you can join Bright Blue for the bargain price of 10 pounds during <laughs> conference. <laughs> during conference only. So there is no reason not to join Bright Blue you can do that by going onto our website. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well done.